Good morning, Ohio. It's James Lewis of This Dream House, a show that's all about the house. Joining us today is Ben Lindbergh, author of The MVP Machine, how baseball's new nonconformists are using data to build better players. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. So what inspired you to write the book? Well, I and my co-author, Travis Sachik, we started noticing that seemed like an awful lot of players were transforming their careers, you know, late in their careers, middle of their careers, guys like Rich Hill, Justin Turner, J.D. Martinez. These were veteran players who we thought we knew as, you know, fringy guys who were just trying to hang on in baseball. And then all of a sudden, these were superstars putting up huge numbers and getting big contracts. And we started wondering what's going on here. And it seemed like we just kept noticing year after year, guys were reinventing themselves. Sometimes it was a swing change. Sometimes they picked up a new pitch. Sometimes they started throwing a pitch that was really good and they just hadn't thrown it enough before. And guys were really transforming their careers. And we realized that it was because the new phase of baseball, it's all about player development. And, you know, we've been talking about Moneyball now for 15 years and Moneyball was all about going out and getting guys who were already good, but for whatever reason, the market just undervalued what they did. And now that every team is doing things that way every team has smart stat people in the front office that are looking at players past performance you just can't win that way anymore so the big competitive advantage in baseball now is not about finding talent it's about creating talent or enhancing talent using all this information and technology to build better players and i'm guessing they're doing it a lot different than they were doing in the the 80s and 90s when like or no actually i guess it'd be 90s and early 2000s when say someone like aaron boone went from being an okay player to a power hitter all of a sudden yeah, I mean, there have always been players who've gone from not so great to, to better uh, and guys who are tinkering with their swing and that sort of thing. But these days it's being done in such a, a scientific way where you're bringing in all this data, all this technology. You know, it's not trial and error. It's not going by feel. It's not having to run into the right coach at the right time who can help you or maybe a teammate shows you something. I mean, that's worked for a lot of guys. So who is the, um, the smarter teams, or does everybody seem to be uh, picking up on it? Hello? <laughs> Sorry, hey, I lost you there say, for a second. Yeah, no that's worries. okay. So... Sure. Uh, pick up that answer from the start yes sir that'd be great okay well everyone's getting into it these days i think now that teams are recognizing the potential advantages but the real trailblazer the real poster team here is the houston astros and they're the team that gets the the big featured long chapter in our book i think everyone who follows baseball knows what they've done at the big league level obviously they won a world series a couple of years ago they've been really successful since but it goes all the way down through their minor league system where they've just set up this process and this pipeline where they're giving guys access to information and making the most of their talents all the way down from AAA to the Dominican Summer League. So they have this great wealth of prospects that's coming along now in addition to the guys at the big league level. So the people that were saying they were just losing to win were sour grapes. They actually are developing the players. They're actually doing things to to make the players better, it sounds like. Very much so. I mean, it's true that, that they did do a very extreme rebuild or tank or whatever you want to call it, and they won 50-something games for a few years now, and, and that helps them. You know, they got some high draft picks, but it's been years now since they were getting number one picks, and they still have a really rich farm system, and that's not so much because they've been losing lately. Obviously, they haven't. It's because they've pioneered all these player development methods, and, you know, they really turned over their entire minor league staff. They got rid of a lot of people who kind of wanted to do things the traditional way and they brought in people who were open to new ideas new technology and they expanded their player development staff dramatically and i think it's really paid dividends and now other teams are trying to poach people from the astros so astros front office people astros coaches were very much in demand over this past winter because all the other teams are looking at what they're doing and say we want to do some of that too what are the new analytical tools that they're using 
Well, the one that the Astros have really employed to great effect is called an Entertronic camera. It's a high-speed, high-definition camera that just came on the market a few years ago and, and became affordable. And they have bought 75 of these cameras, you know, before some other teams bought even one. And what it allows you to do, it's been particularly effective for pitchers who can train this camera on their hands as they throw the ball. And you can see just with unprecedented detail exactly how the ball is coming out of your fingers. We've talked to pitchers who just didn't know what they were doing until they saw this footage and, and said, I didn't even know that the ball was coming out of my hands like that. And so once you see exactly how it's coming off your fingers and then you pair that with some other pitch tracking device. So, you know, that's another thing that teams have employed, something called a, a Rapsodo device that basically just tracks the, the ball as it flies and tells you exactly how it's spinning and what the axis of its spin is and exactly how it's moving. So you can see how the ball's coming out of your hands, then you can see exactly how it's spinning. And once you know all that, you can then make adjustments. So if you say, well, I want my pitch to behave like this, then you can tweak how you're gripping it. You can see how that produces an effect on, on the data. And it's just this really intelligent way to, to go about making yourself better. And the same sort of thing is happening for hitters now with swing sensors that you stick on your bat or even on your body as you swing. And they'll tell you exactly, you know, the sequence of your body parts firing and the strength and the rotation and the speed. And so if there's some part in that process where you're falling a little short, you can now quantify and identify that. And once you identify it, you can fix it. So were the athletes or the teams uh, more eager to embrace the technology? Yeah, that's a great question because a lot of the books in this Moneyball mold are about teams doing these things and imposing their will on the players. And this book is really more player driven because the players now are at the forefront of this. And, you know, today's players grew up in this Moneyball era, so they're more receptive to these stats and this information. It's, it's not like it was 20 years ago when it was, you know, the jocks versus the nerds who never played the game and what do the nerds have to teach us about baseball. Now the players have seen all these other guys get better and they think, what are those guys doing? I want to do something like that. What coach did you go see? What information are you using? And these guys are really hungry for this information. So you have this new generation of players coming up now who are really eager to embrace this. And in some cases, they've even been the driving forces. So, you know, we talk about Trevor Bauer in the book. He's the Cleveland Indians pitcher. And he was kind of crucial in introducing those cameras I was just talking about into baseball you know the the Astros bought a whole bunch of them and other teams that bought them but he was really the first one to just see this thing on the internet and think God, maybe I can use this to make myself better so a lot of players are really responsible for spreading the word about this stuff and you know if it makes them better they kind of become evangelists where Justin Turner will go to another clubhouse or JD Martinez will go to Boston and he'll take all this knowledge with him and try to teach other players around him. So is that how uh, undersized players are becoming sluggers, is through technology? Yeah, so we've seen guys like Mookie Betts last year, who was the MVP, Alex Bregman, Francisco Lindor, guys like this who are sort of undersized by big league standards, but they've figured out how to make up for that deficiency and hit for a lot of power, which is make contact with the ball out in front of the plate, pull it, you know, the old teaching about, well, you want to level swing or you want to hit down on the ball or you want to go the other way. Uh, you know, for certain guys at certain times that may have made sense, but on the whole, you want a slight upswing. You want to pull the ball. That's how you hit it the hardest. And so last year, there was the lowest correlation in decades between height and power. So, you know, it used to be that to be a slugger, you had to be a big guy for the most part. These days, that's less and less true. So you see these 5'8", five, 5'9", even smaller guys hitting for a ton of power and that's because they're being smarter about their swings so with that the the game seems like it's going better the players are better but why do fans and some of the media feel that the game is worse to watch yeah, that's the thing. I mean, players are getting better all the time. Today's players are the best who've ever played baseball. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the sport is more entertaining because today's players are getting so good that they're almost 
breaking baseball, you know, the way that it's traditionally worked. You've got players, pitchers throwing so hard. You've got guys breaking balls moving more than ever. You've got hitters trying to hit home runs, which makes sense, statistically speaking, but also means lots of home runs. And so what we're seeing now is fewer and fewer balls in play. You know, everything is strikeouts, walks, and home runs. It's an efficient game, but it's sort of a static game, you know? Not a lot of balls in play, not a lot of base running. It's just sort of slow and not as dynamic as baseball used to be. So I think that is a concern because all of these trends I'm talking about in the book, all of these developmental advances are leading to a game that looks more and more like that and less and less like the game we used to know. So if MLB wants to stop that ever-increasing strikeout rate, it might have to take some steps, you know, whether that is changing the strike zone, lowering the mound, moving the mound back, changing the ball. There are things they can do, but at this point, I don't think it's going to reverse itself because things are just heading in this direction. With these three, uh, or no, four categories, uh, percentage-wise, what do you feel is the most important Drafting, signing, trading, or developing? <laughs> well, as the guy who just wrote a book about developing, uh, maybe I'm a little bit biased. I mean, I think in the past, we've focused on trading and drafting and signing free agents. And those are all really important. Those will always be important. I mean, you have to acquire talent. But I think we've just disproportionately devoted our attention to that, to going and getting guys. I mean, there just haven't been any books about player development before because, A, it's, it's sort of a behind-the-scenes process. It's hard to see how it happens, but also I think there's been a perception in baseball for a long time, and you know we have lots of quotes and examples in the book of, of people just saying, like, you know, your talent is your talent, and maybe you can refine it a little bit, maybe you can tweak things here and there, but you're not going to go from bad to good, from good to great, and yet we're seeing guys make that kind of transformation now. So uh, even as we've seen the free agent market totally stagnate lately, where, you know, average MLB South Salaries have actually decreased in a, a couple consecutive years. We've also seen just a, a really active market when it comes to teams hiring coaches, hiring front office people, investing in the kind of technology I've been talking about. Because I think teams realize that's where the big advantage is. This is the frontier. You know, all these other things we've been doing for decades and centuries. This is where the new technology can really make a, a huge impact in the team today. So was it the Expos were that much better at developing or were is was it because of they were just drafting so high and they were getting the better talent? Well, I think the Expos did have a good run of, of development. And, you know, we talk about in the book some of the precursors to this modern movement. And you go back and, you know, Brinch Rickey was talking about all this stuff. And, you know, the Royals Academy was an experiment in the, the 70s that was kind of along these lines. So from time to time, teams would really strike gold when it came to players, you know, whether it was draft or some combination of draft and development. Or, you know, you would just have these ideas that made a lot of sense, but traditional baseball people just kind of rejected them because, you know, for the longest time in baseball, if you wanted to be a coach, you pretty much had to be a player. That was how you became a coach, and so if you were a former player, then you would say, well, this is how I was taught, and it worked for me, so this is how I'll teach this next generation, and so not a whole lot changed, but the ideas have been out there for a while, and obviously, you know, relative to other teams, certain teams have always done a good job of developing, but I think the potential potential out there now is just much greater to really make an impact in players' careers. So is it better to uh, build a young player up or to rebuild uh, an existing player? Well, I think it, it can work really well in both cases. You know, I think probably we'll see less of the latter as time goes on because a lot of these changes that we've seen lately with established players, you know, these are guys who, when they were coming up, these ideas, this technology wasn't available. So nowadays, players are getting introduced to these concepts in high school, in college, you know, in the minors, certainly. And so we're seeing this big youth movement in baseball now where so many of the best players in the sport are under 25 and you don't see a whole lot of old guys excelling the way you used to. And I think that's in part because the young players coming up now have been introduced to all of this uh, you know, better instruction, better technology as they've come up through the minors. And so by the time they get to the big leagues, they don't have as much to learn, I think, just through experience and trial and error as earlier generations did. But there 
there's still guys out there, I think, who didn't come up under this system, who, you know, came up at a time when all of these tools weren't available. And so if they embrace those things at, you know, advanced stages, they can really make great changes. And, and some of the most notable examples that we've seen, you know, Rich Hill, when he came back from obscurity in 2015 to become one of the best pitchers in baseball, he was 35 years old and he'd been bouncing around indie ball and the minors and the majors for, you know, a decade or more. And uh, it just took one change that was recommended to him based on the data for him to be better than he'd ever been before. So some of those guys are still out there. And you've certainly seen the Astros make a habit of trying trading for pitchers in the past few years and making them much better than they'd ever been. You know, whether it's even a guy like Justin Verlander or Garrett Cole or Charlie Morton or Colin McHugh or Ryan Presley, just a long line of guys who had been in the big leagues, but you know, the Astros realized that they could do something a little bit different and they were able to communicate that and persuade the player. Sounds great. So it sounds like a lot of teams are really starting to open up to the idea of uh, developing the players, making them better, and in theory making the league better. Uh, before we let you go, Ben, uh, where on social media and the web should they check you out at? You can find me on Twitter at my name, Ben Lindbergh, and you can find all my writing at The Ringer. I also do a podcast for Fangraphs called Effectively Wild, and uh, of course you can get the book anywhere books are sold. It's called The MVP Machine. Sounds great. Thank you for joining us today, Ben. Thank you.